Hello, everyone. This is the first of a series of lectures on our next topic, which is earthquakes, uh, closely related to plate tectonics, as we've all discussed. Um, I'm first going to talk about um, what an earthquake is. Uh, in here, you'll also find the types of faults uh, produced by convergent, divergent, and transform boundaries. Um, a couple of those have earthquakes associated with them. So I'll talk about the types of faulting. And I have some things in lab that will also be helpful in kind of envisioning how um, the, the types of um, configurations of, uh, of rock types uh, that we see based on age, more or less, that we see at different faults. And now you can tell what the type of fault you're looking at is. Uh, and then also, I'm going to talk about the waves that are produced, seismic waves. Um, and then we'll get into how scientists use these waves to triangulate uh, epicenters and focal points of earthquakes. So the questions we need to ask ourselves here are, what is an earthquake? What causes earthquakes? What are earthquake hazards? Can we predict earthquakes? And how do we plan for them? So let's talk a little bit about the difference of hazard and risk. So, um, you know, there, there's a risk before uh, an event occurs. We have risks and then we have hazards. And uh, a hazard is usually when that risk becomes realized and is sort of dangerous. And one thing I like to point out here a lot of the time with particularly with geological events and um, natural hazards, is that were there not cities in the path of a hurricane or built on a fault line that frequently has earthquakes, we generally don't think of them as hazards to us, to society, to human structures and things like that, or infrastructure. It's because we choose to build in these places, and I'll talk about this when we talk about volcanoes too, the fact that we choose to build infrastructure in places that are geologically active is part of the reason that natural hazards are hazards at all. So for earthquakes, uh, it, it's worth kind of reviewing here what a wave is. So, uh, and you often hear the words amplitude and wavelength thrown around. And um, this here, this, uh, it's, it's this lambda symbol here and down here. This is a wavelength. That is the length of, or in distance um, between the crest of a wave and the crest of the following wave or the preceding wave. And also because waves are symmetrical, generally speaking, and for our purposes, uh, that can also be true of the trough to the trough between the two waves. So from the trough to the crest, not a wavelength. That'd be half a wavelength. So, um, and then the amplitude is the distance from the center of the wave. So something with a stronger amplitude would have a wave that goes up higher here and down lower there and up higher there. So amplitude is just from the center to the crest or from the center to the trough, and they will be the same length. So amplitude is not from the top of the crest to the bottom of the trough. It's just from the center up or from the center down. This should look familiar to you based on the activity we did in lab last week. This is the worldwide distribution of earthquakes. Notice heavy earthquake activity at plate boundaries not so much in the middle of continents, although we do periodically get little ones. I think there was one in Michigan uh, back in like 2015, it knocked over somebody's lawn chair maybe or something. Uh, not too bad in the middle of the continent. So what is an earthquake? Well, it's a shaking or vibration of the ground. It's often caused by sudden offsets uh, along fault uh, faults, uh, and those faults are generally associated with the plate boundaries that we talked about in the last chapter. And you get certain kinds of earthquakes at convergent boundaries, you get certain kind of earthquakes at 
divergent boundaries and you get certain kinds of earthquakes at transform boundaries because those faults are moving uh, in different ways. So we'll talk about that. So what causes earthquakes? Well, it's a sudden movement along a fault. That's the most common, okay? And that could be um, a normal fault, that could be a thrust fault, or that could be a slip strike fault. These are the three types that we find. You can get earthquakes from volcanic eruptions because volcanic eruptions are either the buildup and sudden eruption of material and uh, or, or uh, of like magmatic material, let's say, but also of gases and things like that, um, subsidence of, from, uh, you know, uh, landslides or the melting of glaciers and things like that change, uh, causes changes in the in the, the the near surface crust and that can result in earthquakes as well. Obviously, a meteorite impact can cause earthquakes. Uh, I'm sure we can all imagine how that might be the case. Uh, imagine just dropping a pebble into a pond. Now imagine that pebble is a um, a piece of rock the size of Manhattan. Um, you'd get similar ripples in the solid uh, ground. We can have induced seismicity. This is often done by fracking, and this is where we take things out of the crust, um, or we put things back into the crust. Oftentimes this can cause swelling or subsidence and collapse uh, and things like that, and this can induce seismicity as well. And seismicity is just another way of saying earthquake activity. So here it's uh, important to talk about the sudden movement along a fault and what that means for, you know, in, in, in reference to these two terms over here. So fo the focus, what we say is that's the site of the actual rupture. So here we've got ourselves a fault of some sort. Okay, that's a, a split in the ground here. Um, and here's our fault scarp, which is where that fault is exposed on the surface. So you've got some kind of a shifting of this fault, either this part's going down over here and this part's going up relative to one another or the other way around. And when that happens, you get the focus of the earthquake on the fault itself, okay? And that could be at depth and oftentimes is at some depth in the crust. When we hear uh, seismologists talk about the epicenter, that's where you just project the area of the focus directly up, straight up, to the surface of the earth, okay? Because we are, uh, you know, we are, are beings that live on the surface of the earth. Um, we kind of like to reference everything from that. So the epicenter is not the actual spot where the earthquake happened uh, in the crust, but rather the projection of that location onto the surface. So here, let's get into the types of faults. So. This first one here is called a tensional or normal fault. Uh, I also call these extensional faults. And take a look at these arrows here and think about where, uh, at what kind of plate boundary we might see a fault like this. So if you said divergent boundary, you'd be correct. So here we have <clears throat> the direction of the material on this side of the fault and the direction of the material on this side of the fault um, are diverging away from each other. So this is a result of extension, okay, which is a result of spreading, okay? So this is, a, this is the type of thing we would find closest to a rift or to, uh, you know, a divergent boundary. Okay, so I want, there's some terminology here that I'm gonna use uh, when I'm talking about um, these types of faults, whether they're normal or reverse. And this is, the, uh, this is a concept that I'll, I'll show you in lab if you have any questions, but I'll just briefly mention it here. Notice that the fault is at an angle, right here, okay? Relative to, you know, it's at about a 45 degree angle in this picture from, from the surface or from the vertical, right? If you, if you can stand on either part of this, if this were a, you know, a, like a hill, let's say, right, a 45 degree hill, this part here on the bottom is the part you could stand on, right? We call that the foot wall, okay? That's the part where the bottom of the triangle is to the 
right in this in this instance okay so that's the foot wall and then the opposite side if you imagine we separated this up we lifted this hang wall up so a person could stand in between these two the part you could reach up and touch we call the hanging wall and that's irrespective of these arrows okay we don't care which way these things are moving relative to each other there's always a foot wall and there's always a hang wall unless the fault is truly 90 degrees okay up and down which doesn't happen in nature very much so when we have the hang wall drop relative to the foot wall you'll notice these sedimentary layers here this bottom sedimentary layer was once up here right this would have been a continuous horizontal sedimentary layer and because there's extension there's faulting and because there's faulting and because of the fact that it's extending you can imagine me pulling this apart and this hang wall is going to preferentially want to slide down as such when we look at normal faults we look at in this case this gray uh, big gray chunk of sediment here this is going to be older than the part above it and this part's older than that part above that and this part's older than that part above that so um, when we get to sedimentary rocks we'll talk about this more in depth but things get younger as you go up in a in, a, in an undeformed sedimentary package as such when you're in a normal fault if you're standing on the foot wall and you're looking across to the hang wall you're going to see younger material on the hang wall um, I'm standing here this younger material would have been way up here so it's younger so if I'm standing at the foot wall looking at the hang wall I'm going from old to young uh, on the other hand if I'm at a reverse fault and take a look at these arrows and try to think about what kind of plate boundary this might be at well yep these arrows are going together so we're at a convergent boundary we still have a foot wall we still have a hang wall but notice these arrows now the hang wall is moving up relative to the foot wall because this is being smushed together and so that material imagine pushing your friend up a slide okay where the slide is the foot wall and the hanging wall is um, sort of your friend I guess you could think of it like that in this case when we go from the foot wall to the hang wall we're going from younger material to older material now and this is very common in compressional um, plate boundaries right so convergent plate boundaries and we see them most commonly in continent to continent convergence right um, we we see them we see them at, at subduct uh, subduction zones too because that is compressional um, this you would see right in the continent to continent contact and yeah but in subduction zones you see it as well because there is convergence there so this is just a stress you could find these faults 100 miles 150 200 500 miles away from a compression zone right from a convergent boundary we see it at the boundary and then we see it kind of rippling out and getting a little weaker and weaker as you move away from that boundary so you know in general you think of convergence as happening just between two plates but the effects of that can be seen as you move away in both plates as well right imagine you know you're smashing you're pushing two rugs together you know where the rugs meet you might have the most compression there and but the the where your hand is pushing on that rug as well is also going to have some folding and some uh, some deformation and that's the same thing we see here one type of reverse fault um, is when you have a really 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 shallow dipping foot wall right so this is where you tend to have a fault that's about 30 degrees or less okay from uh from horizontal so here this is maybe only 15 degrees 10 degrees right like this would be horizontal going straight across so this angle between wouldn't be that much this is what we call a thrust fault it's compressional as well okay but um, you get different types of features on the surface based on the fact that this fault is at a lower angle than the fault in the previous slide 
And then of course we have slip strike faults. And if you look at these arrows, you can tell that they are probably found at a transform boundary. And this is where two plates are sliding past each other. But you can get slip strike faults just like in any other fault. You can see effects and other stri slip strike faults as you move away from the actual plate boundary too. Okay, because these are sort of regional features. Here we have um, arrows pointing in the direction of plate motion here in the middle, just like we did on the previous slides. Uh, although those were cross sections, we were looking at the, the sort of vertical cross section. Here we're looking at um, sort of a, a you know horizontal movement, right? And in this case, the way we name these is if you're standing on one plate and you're looking across the boundary to the other plate, you'll see movement to either the right or the left. And I want you to notice and try to visualize here. If I'm standing on this plate and I'm looking over there, this plate's moving to the right. So that's a, this is a right lateral fault. Now, use your imagination, spin yourself around over to here and imagine I'm standing up here and I'm looking down at this plate. It's still the opposite plate in this case, now it's this plate is the opposite plate. If I were standing over here, it is moving to the right as well. Okay, so this, no matter what side you're on, the other plate is moving to the right of you. Okay, and that's why we call this a right lateral fault. And then if this was flipped, we'd call it a left lateral fault. Um, two other important terms for this, uh, when it's um, right lateral, we call it a dextral fault. And if it's to the left, we call it a sinistral fault. All right, <clears throat> so sudden movement along the fault is a result of stress and strain. So rocks at plate boundaries, convergent boundaries and transform boundaries specifically are under stress, which is just a force over a unit area. So pounds per square inch, uh, for example, kilograms per square centimeter, something along these lines. There's how much force is being exerted on a rock at a given point throughout that rock. So as you can imagine, stress is different uh, at different places uh, due to rock type, um, the composition of the rock, um, things like that. And as stress is applied to rocks, they build up strain and deform. So um, they will compress, they will extend, they will uh, deform in folds and things like this. And along a transform boundary and along subduction boundaries, as strain builds up, I want you to just like kind of put two fists together so your knuckles are interlocked like a zipper and try to slide them past each other. And as you do this, if you're pushing together, and you're trying to slide sideways, you'll find it's very difficult, right? But as you try, don't hurt yourself, but as you try, you'll see that your strain is starting to get like stored, right? Your muscles are starting to tense up and that's the same as strain being stored in a rock. And when your knuckles finally do slide past each other, all of that built up energy dissipates and you can feel, you know, even in the muscles in your hands and in your arms, um, all of a sudden those muscles relax. So all of that strain was suddenly released by the movement of your knuckles. And it's the same in rocks, okay? And those, that stored strain, once it's released, is, uh, is released in the form of vibrational energy. So a way to envision this is through a number of different things, elastic rebound theory, which is when you transmit seismic wave energy, material must be strong enough to rebound back. That means it cannot generate an earthquake in soft material. Okay, I encourage you to look at this link. Um, but rocks will break and rebound to their original shape. And to efficiently transmit seismic wave energy, material must have elastic properties or the ability to rebound back. And this is what I want you to think about. So in the deformation in rocks, um, I'll have in, in this column here, and then the deformation of, of a sort of like kind of limber stick, a sort of bendable stick, think like maybe some bamboo or something like that, that can bend and then it returns back to this original shape of being straight. 
so here would be the an, uh, initial position right of uh, of a fault okay and this is the undeformed kind of original position of the rock as this moves to the north in this case let's say along the fault we're getting a buildup of strain here and that's the same as if you were slightly bending this stick now if i let if you stopped doing that this would just rebound back to its original shape but if you continue to bend it and continue to bend it you start to get slippage along this fault in the case of the ground and notice the arrows are moving in opposite directions but in the case of the stick you get a rupture right and that rupture is the um the sudden release of that strain that you were building up in b here and it's the same in the earth it's a sudden release it's a shaking okay so those waves are going to go out into uh, the world right uh, away from this fault and then in d now we have offset here and the strain is released there's no more strain anymore there's still tectonic forces acting on it but in this particular snapshot the strain is gone and down here we see the same thing the strain is gone here um, from the stick so when it comes to earthquakes what are we actually looking at what what actually is happening so when the rocks along the fault are under strain they eventually fail due to side to due, due to plate tectonic forces um the you know the plates are pushing and pushing and pushing or sliding and sliding and eventually those rocks fail and when they do seismic waves are produced and they are the earthquake okay so they spread out in in all directions away from the fault and they produce three distinct waves that we're going to talk about in this class um, the first is the primary wave and this wave is what we see down here in the bottom left and the direction of the of the the propagation of these waves the direction is away from the, the fault away from the, the area but um, these waves are very different um, these two here the p and the s waves p waves think about i like to picture a slinky imagine me holding a slinky on its side um, so the, the 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 two holes of the slinky are in my hands and i'm holding it vertically or horizontally rather sorry and as i pull the slinky and then push the slinky the the propagation of the waves is moving in the direction of of this wave here of the of the propagation of the waves overall and we, so think about it like this this imagine this dark part is being pushed in the direction and then the back of the slinky is coming up behind it so you get areas where it's compressed and areas where it's expanded and i'll go over this more in lab but these are where the waves are propagating directionally right not like the wave in the ocean that we looked at in the previous slide where it's going up and down but rather going forward and then snapping back and then forward and then snapping back and then it moves uh, along you know this direction in that way moving forward snapping back moving forward snapping back but moving like this okay um, it's hard to explain in a, in a powerpoint but I'll, I'll show you in lab um, but there's some pretty helpful videos you can find that would illustrate this then we have and those are p waves or primary waves then we have secondary waves or s waves and these are also a good way to remember shear waves okay and shear means tearing right and so uh, in this case these s waves these secondary waves and they are produced by an earthquake secondarily right they move more like a wave in the ocean where they move up and down like this so they're moving and that's how they propagate but they're propagating perpendicular or at a 90 degree angle from the direction of the waves okay so the wave is moving to the right but the wave itself is functioning in a way that it's moving up and down like this imagine uh taking a jump rope on the ground and doing like the inchworm thing to it and then that wave propagates in the direction away from you right so if this is you you flip that jump rope and that wave is moving away from you in this direction but the the movement of it is up and down like an inchworm okay and these are 
as such they're called sh uh, shear waves for that reason because this is a shearing uh, type of wave and then we have l waves which are long waves or surface waves and those can move up and down this way or they can move side to side this way but they're at the surface and i'll talk a little bit more about what that means coming up and so we'll talk specifically now about uh, these these different waves but i i just want to point out one thing really quick um imagine at these faults when you have strain building up and then it's suddenly released that's affecting the rock in all directions away from that that focal point or the focus of the earthquake and like I said, the epicenter is where we see it expressed on the surface. But basically you have to think about it. These, these waves are produced by this sudden release of energy. And there's only three directions in which waves can propagate, forward and back, up and down, and left and right, right? So all of these things, you know, these P waves and these S waves are being produced by a single slippage in a single spot uh, sometimes multiple spots at a time but you know usually at a single spot and that's affecting the rock for you know by by pushing it and expanding it and contracting it it's also affecting it by shearing it up and down and it's it's also it can it can uh, shear it left to right and what happens here is that these waves are moving through the rock at different speeds and the fastest one is the P wave. That's why we call it the primary wave because it's the first wave to reach anybody outside of the epicenter of the earthquake. It's the fast, it moves through rock the fastest. And so it's the first one. So it's the primary one we get. And like I said before, it, it moves by alternately compressing and expanding material. Uh, here's a slinky down here to show you. So here's the slinky at rest, right? All the uh, little uh, loops of the slinky are equal distant apart. And then if I push the slinky, right, I'm going to compress the slinky here. And that compression is going to cause expansion behind it. And then as I continue to push it, I'll get compression here. Here's the expansion and here's some more compression. And then the rest of the slinky is still at rest because no compressive portion of the slinky has reached this far yet until we get down here till the end and we see compression making its way. So just from one single push up here, or pardon me, right here, I'm compressing and expanding, compressing and expanding almost like an accordion across in the direction of the wave. So that's how a P wave works. This is what that would look like in the ground. So here we have areas of compression and areas of expansion. And so, you know, you have expansion, compression in between the arrows, then expansion and compression between the arrows, and the wave is propagating to the right as we push and expand, push and expand, right? And that's just the rock's response to one single wave moving through. Um, now, uh, on the surface, we would see something like this, no side to side motion, more just kind of crumpling and, and, and things like that from that expansion. Um, and this is analogous to sound waves. This is what your speaker is doing when you're listening to speakers. Um, it's pushing the air out. It's compressing the air as it moves towards you. It's not moving up and down like a sine wave. It's, it's actually compressing or pushing air or water or rock or whatever, right? It's compressing it. Uh, P waves generally travel through solid rock at about five kilometers per second. And as you get more rigidity, so think denser, more tightly packed rock, you actually get those waves moving faster, okay? And um, we call these low amplitude waves because they cause very little property damage. They're just the initial kind of first burst of energy. And because it's compacting and expanding, um, we see minimal damage on the surface. I mean, this is damaged, obviously, but you get a couple down power lines, maybe some cracks in a street, but there's no side to side movement here. This probably would not um, damage a, a structure. It might just shake it a little bit, you know? So this is the initial thing where everyone starts to be like, oh, wow, weird, what was that? Um, and unfortunately, the, F's wave, the S waves 
are uh, are soon to follow after you uh, get these P waves. So it's it's kind of the warning shot of an earthquake. So next we have the S waves. Uh, they're secondary, so they're slower than P waves. They arrive after, uh, as I say down here. Um, we call them shear waves because they they move in a in a in a, in a way that they they're shearing, so they're they're kind of tearing the ground up and down, or side to side. Uh, here's that rope analogy. So here's a rope at rest, and then you shake the rope, and you'll see the particle motion. So um, particle motion in this case is, you know, obviously that wave is not moving along the rope as one solid thing. When if when this wave is over here, that's a that's a different part of the rope than it was over here. So what's the rope actually doing? Well, at any one single spot on the rope, we see that we call that particle motion because that particle is not moving down the, the way with the wave. It's just the wave is being created by those particles moving up and down like this, okay? So the particle motion here is up and down, right? Up and down. But the wave direction is this way. So hopefully that makes sense. And this is what that would look like. And this is the ground moving up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And the wave is propagating to the right. And this causes much more property damage, okay? Um, because the ground motion in this case is much more dramatic. And these are slower than the P waves, so they show up later. And then, because um, these waves are propagating um, up to the surface, once they get to the surface, um, the, if this makes any sense, the surface gets all of the result of those waves, right? There's nowhere above this ground, above this street, where those waves can continue, right? So once stuff hits here, it's all expressed on the surface. And we call those L waves, right? These are the most destructive earthquake waves um, on the surface because they are surface waves. And they're literally displacing large portions of the ground surface. Uh, L waves tend to move side to side, uh, and when they do, we call them love waves, and that's where um, literally the ground is shaking side to side, back and forth, back and forth, and you can see down here, it's not really a side to side motion, it's some kind of other complex sort of motion, but on the surface, it, uh, it looks like just side to side motion, and it can offset streets like this. This is a cartoon, but this really happens. Sometimes you can see it happening in real life. And then we have Raleigh waves, and those kind of produce like a rolling motion, okay? So more up and down motion, and this is more like a wave on a, on a, a surface of the water, okay? But in this case, ground, and you can see how much damage that would do as well. So to put this in perspective, um, in increasing speed, so I want you to look at this and think, well, what would be the, uh, the slowest thing and the fastest thing? Well. First, the slowest thing in this list is Usain Bolt, uh, a person, right? He was an Olympic runner. He runs about 28 miles per hour, which is pretty darn fast. Next, we have a car, which is at about 75 miles per hour. Next, we have a commercial jet, which is about 550 miles per hour. Uh, sound, which is about 770 miles per hour or so which is slower than a bullet, which is at about 2592 miles per hour. That's why if you ever, I mean, if you get shot by a bullet, you're gonna get hit before you hear the sound of the bullet, which is kind of morbid, but that's the way sound is. Sounds fairly slow uh, relative to other waves, other natural waves. And then a seismic wave, which is 11,000 miles per hour. So almost, almost four times as fast as a bullet. Um, and it's much faster in the mantle, and I'll talk about why that is. So we actually have a seismometer here in our classroom, uh, in lab. If you look over to the uh, south side of the room, you'll see a plexiglass box with uh, some instrumentation in there and a computer attached to it, and that's the GRMI seismometer. And this is an actual uh, slide from our uh, seismic software that picked up an earthquake in Ecuador 
um, and that was a magnitude 6.7 earthquake. Sorry about that typo there. There should be an R right there. It is not an ETH quake. Uh, it's an earthquake in Ecuador. And if we know that seismic waves travel at about 1,100 miles per hour, uh, and these are the, the P waves, basically, and Ecuador is 2,867 miles away, we can figure out how long it took just by dividing these things, how long it took for the earthquake to reach our seismic station. And if you calculate it, it's about 15 minutes. But in actuality, it was nine minutes. And we know that because we, we can go on to a database that monitors all earthquakes on the planet, and we can see exactly when that eruption happened, and we can see exactly when our seismometer picked it up, and it was actually nine minutes, not 15. So again, as my mantra in this class is nature is messy, and I want you to think a little bit about um, why this might be the case, why the, um, the calculated distance and the actual, or calculated time and the actual time are different, because that's going to be a prompt for one of our discussion questions. So I'm going to briefly go over locating earthquakes in this section, um, because you'll need this for lab. So to locate earthquakes, we have seismographs, uh, which are instruments that record vibrations in the Earth's crust. And they produce the actual record, which we call a seismogram. And oftentimes they're encased deep in bedrock. Obviously ours is just on a counter, so there's a lot of um, noise, shall we say, especially when uh, people are uh, being let out of class and going into other classes we see all the time. So it's, it's never like pretty, um, and you know, flat lines when there aren't earthquakes like you would find in something like this, um, because this bedrock here would shield most of the surface movement, uh, people moving around, cars, machinery, blah, blah, blah. It would pick those up, but it would pick those up um, in a much more isolated way. Um, so uh, very different from our, our uh, seismograph here. And the old school way to do this is you'd have a pendulum hanging inside a box with a little scroll of paper, uh, which we call the uh, recording drum. And it's bolted directly to the bedrock. So uh, the vibrations would move up into this plate and they would move up this rigid steel box and they would shake this rope uh, and the pendulum would therefore swing back and forth and it would produce these seismogram waves on the drum. And then it would record that as it's going, feeding paper in and rolling up. And then um, seism uh, seismologists would go in periodically and they would pull this tape. They would put new tape in and then they would unfurl this whole thing, and then they would look at the waves uh, recorded on the drum. Here's ours on the side of the room. Uh, it's a slightly different uh, setup in that it's basically uh, something sitting on the counter, and when there's seismic activity, it moves. Um, these are electrodes here relative to one another. Uh, sort of like uh, the thing that beeps when you walk into a door. It's just a, there's, there's really sensitive magnetic uh, coils in here. When they move back and forth or up and down relative to one another, they can record that. And then it creates a digital output of those waves, right? And then is read by software on the computer over here to the left. So like I said, P waves are the fastest, followed by S waves and then surface waves, okay? So if you were looking at a, um, an unfurled uh, drum recording on the paper there, the first thing you'd see is these kind of tiny little initial waves. There'd be a, a bigger first wave, that's that first peak, so that's the first P wave. And then it kind of peters out here as that compression is moving past this location. Uh, and each one of these little lines here denotes a minute because the tape is being fed at a specific speed. That's how geologists are able to correlate times with, uh, with the, the wave relationships here. Then you'd see just a little bit of noise, a little bit of noise, then all of a sudden, boom, the first S wave. And those are going to be much larger than the P wave. Okay. And those are the shear waves moving through the ground. Okay, and they're being picked up by the by the earthquake. 
but under that spot. Then we see those waves catch up with the actual surface, and that's when we see the most movement, okay? So these surface waves are the last things to happen. That's why when you see videos of earthquakes, there's always people walking through a mall or something, and maybe things shake a little bit, maybe a light goes out, and they're like, huh? And then there's some confusion, and then all of a sudden, they start to like really feel shaking, and they're like, uh-oh, starting to get freaked out. And then right when that dawns on them, all of a sudden, boom, walls start falling down, ceilings start collapsing, all kinds of mayhem, right? Those are the S waves that, you, that they're experiencing there. So to locate these, um, we know the speed of both waves, right? We, um, and and we, 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 tend, we know these um, because they're relative to one another, and they tend to move through um, sort of average earth materials uh, at certain speeds. Um, based on the different times that a P wave and an S wave arrive, um, we can determine how far away that earthquake is. Because if we know the speed of both a P wave and an S wave, we know when the P wave arrives and then we know how long before the S wave arrives, we can determine whether the earthquake was far away, in this case, WUAZ, this would have been further away, because remember, P waves and S waves, P waves are faster than S, S waves. So if there's more space between them, that means that the P wave has traveled further, okay? Uh, and that'll make more sense as we as we move through uh, this, the rest of this lecture and and the activity we do on uh, in lab will definitely, uh, you know, kind of uh, hit this one home for you. So yeah, the longer the interval between P and S, the more distant the quake. So the main takeaway from this is this was further away than at this location and then at this location, only 14 seconds between the two. So the P and S waves haven't traveled as far, okay? Because again, the P wave is moving faster than the S wave. So here, not a lot of time has elapsed because the P wave and the S wave are closer. As the wave moves further and further away from the epicenter of the earthquake, the P wave, which is faster, is gonna have more distance in front of the S wave. Hopefully that makes sense. And if we were to look at that here, what we do is we, if we know the distance from each one, basically what you do is these are those three different stations we were just looking at. Here's the 14 second one, here's the 73 second one, et cetera. You basically figure out the distance because you know you can figure out the distance and you start at the middle here and you just draw a circle around your station with the radius of that distance. So if, you know, if it was a mile, 14 seconds, if, 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 if the P and S waves tell you that the, you know, the earthquake was 20 miles away, let's say, you would just draw a 40 mile diameter circle where the radius of that circle is the, is the 20 miles. Similarly with this one, because this was our medium one, we would draw another circle. And then similarly, we would do that here with the longest one with the biggest interval between the P and the S wave. Once we draw that, wherever those three circles intersect, which is right here where my cursor is, that's where the earthquake happened. And that's called triangulation. Uh, the FCC in one of my favorite movies growing up, Pump Up the Volume, starring Christian Slater. Uh, this is how they drove around and triangulated the signal to find out where his pirate radio station was that was making all these kids in this small Arizona town rebel against their parents. Anyway. So this is triangulation. This is exactly what is going on there. And you're going to be doing an exercise just like this in lab. So I'll wrap up here. Uh, the second half of this I'll get done by Wednesday. Um, but I wanted you to look at that triangulation part because that is one thing you'll be doing in lab. And I'll get the other part up for Wednesday, but hopefully this just kind of wets your whistle a little bit. Um, and have a great 4th of July. See ya. Okay, so I'm getting this up a little bit later. Uh, this is the beginning of part two of the earthquakes lecture. Um, I've decided to modify the exam schedule. So you're not in a hurry to watch this before this weekend because our first exam, first of two exams will be uh, the end of week four. And this will be on there, but this will give you plenty of time over the weekend to uh, watch this 
Um, next week we're moving right into minerals, and we, even with a little bit of minerals today at the end of the at the end of lab, second half of lab. So I thought I would uh, just sort of reschedule those exams so that you're not struggling to uh, do stuff. It's easier for you. It's easier for me. Um, so we'll just do two exams, 50 multiple choice, same as before, but just two now instead of four, one at the end of week four, one at the beginning of week eight. And it'll basically just split the material that we cover in class in half with the first half being covered at the end of week four and the rest at the beginning of week eight. So for earthquakes, when we talk about intensity, uh, many of you have probably heard about the Richter scale, um, but there's also this thing called the modified Mercalli scale. Uh, or modified Mercalli intensity scale, which normally I have an activity that we do, um, but we're not going to have time to do that this semester. So, uh, but I do want to introduce this to you real quick. And it measures the destructiveness of an earthquake. So this is sort of independent of just the geological intensity. Uh, this is more geared towards sort of human impact. So the destructiveness of an earthquake on a scale of one to 12. And one is you could be walking down the street and the earthquake could happen and you wouldn't even necessarily notice. Um, and then 12 is total apocalyptic damage, waves seen on ground surfaces, objects, people being thrown in the air, um, nasty stuff. So I encourage you to read through that, um, but there won't be uh, an activity for this. There may be something um, with this on the test, though. Geologists will create oftentimes an intensity map. And over on the right there, you'll see a map and those contour lines you see are called uh, isoseismals. And they enclose the area of intensity based on that previous categorization. So there in the center, we'll see we have an eight worth of destruction there at the bottom of uh, kind of Silicon Valley, sort of Santa Cruz area, maybe we're in, uh, Big Sur over there, something like that. Anyway, um, so that's an eight. And then the area around it that experienced a seven worth of Mercalli damage uh, is in that next grouping as you move out from the epicenter. Then we've got a six there, uh, kind of San Francisco Peninsula in the Bay Area, and then down through the mountains there. So then that would be a six. So when we get to topographic lines, they work very similar to this, but this is an intensity um, illustration. So I just wanted to show you that. And hopefully that makes sense to you. More destruction at the epicenter and then less destruction as we move away from the epicenter. Uh, now, normally I would have an activity, but I don't here. So we'll skip this slide. And then we have the Richter scale. And this is earthquake strength based on the maximum amplitude of, on a seismogram. And this has a lot more to do with just the actual waves moving through the ground. So independent of any destruction to human structures. And it's logarithmic, which means that it goes up in multiples of 10. So a, a Richter scale on a one, it'd be like 10. And then a two would be 100 and a three would be a thousand and so on. So it's sort of almost exponential or the inverse of an exponent, which is a logarithm, but we won't get into that too much. You don't need to uh, explain any of this. I just wanted to show you that these are magnitudes and they, they're magnitudes of 10. So a four is 10 times stronger than a three. A three is 10 times stronger than a two. A five is a hundred times stronger than a three and so on, right? So between a four and a seven, that'd be 300 times more. Hopefully that makes sense. And the total energy release increases by a factor of 30. So a magnitude four earthquake releases 30 times more energy than a magnitude three. Um, and this is energy released, so this isn't magnitude. Now notice a magnitude five releases 900 times more energy than a magnitude three. Okay, and there's no upper limit to the the Richter scale, but there is a limit to how much energy a rock can store before it fractures or ruptures. Once it ruptures, that energy is released in the rupture and that could affect the surrounding rock, but 
essentially, if you have a strong enough earthquake, it um, its energy will will dissipate more quickly as it destroys the rock that it's uh, that it's affecting rather than just shaking it. Hopefully, that makes sense. I encourage you to click on some of these links and uh, watch these. This is a, the part of class where I turn all the lights off normally and we sit and watch videos for about a half an hour and pretty intense stuff. Definitely click on these. These are mostly in Asia with one in, uh, in Alaska and one in Ecuador. So give these a watch. Uh, they're horrifying but fascinating at the same time. Geologists, on the other hand, prefer to use the moment magnitude, and it's calculated by using the actual rupture area and displacement. So it's a best, better estimate of the total energy released. So the, calculating the actual rupture area is where the rock begins to fail due to the earthquake. And displacement is how much that rock is moved from its original place at the, at the moment of the earthquake. And it's better at estimating really, really large earthquakes, which we, we're, uh, we're keen to investigate. And it's a lot easier to verify. And this is how we calculate this. And this won't be something that you would have on your test where I would necessarily have you calculate, like give you actual numbers. But it might be a multiple choice where you see these variables multiplied together. You have to identify which ones are correct. So. The moment magnitude measures the size of the earthquake at source at the source proportional to the average displacement on the fault times the rupture area on the fault's surface times the rigidity or strength of the rock. And I'm, I'm not going to go too much further into that and, and, and show you any numbers, um, but I did want to uh, just show you this is the formula that we use, so you might want to uh, jot that down. So let's talk about some earthquake hazards. So the first one is ground shaking. That should make sense to everybody. The second is landslides. So uh, the ground shakes and as a result, material that is sort of loosely compacted on the side of hills and mountains or has uh, long kind of dormant fractures where there hasn't been a lot of movement, but it does create some weakness in the slope. Uh, we can get landslides that way. You can get ground or foundation failure. This is when the flat ground or the foundations of buildings fail. So the ground can actually fail. You can get sinkholes, you can get big fissures opening up, all kinds of things like that. Or you can get foundation failure on structures like houses and bridges and things like that. You can get ground rupture, um, and that's where uh, the ground completely opens up and fails. And you can get changes to ground level, so you can get ground subsidence. This is closely tied in with uh, the third one there as well. We can get fires. And I want you to think about that one for a minute. How would we get fires? And then we can get tsunamis, which some of you pointed out in the, uh, the Google Earth activity uh, about the tsunami in Japan caused by slippage along a subduction zone that caused earthquakes in the ocean. And usually earthquakes in the ocean cause tsunamis, so giant tidal waves. And then we'll talk about how we plan for earthquakes. So for ground shaking, uh, generally this destroys buildings or alters buildings, causes them to sway. We can see some pictures here. There's a house that's, that's collapsed. Here's uh, some buildings that uh, smashed the bejesus out of these cars. Here's a building in Asia, I think, that's been completely tipped over. Uh, so pretty, pretty intense. And one thing to think about here, and for the most part, earthquakes don't kill people, buildings kill people. Uh, so something to keep in mind. It's the thing that I've, that I've mentioned before that I'll say again is these things are hazards because we build our cities in places where things are geologically eventful. Okay, if there were no people there and no buildings there, then these things, uh, animals and plants and, and riverways and things like that would be disrupted, but no people would be hurt. But when we choose to build on sites like this, this is kind of what happens. 
And as a result of these, these shear forces acting on buildings, we try to anticipate that, especially in seismically active areas. So we'll design buildings to accommodate these shearing forces and avoid collapse by an, employing a number of different things. So one, we'll bolt frames and houses to foundations. So the foundation is a big concrete mass that we pour into the ground and then bolt everything to that. We'll build shear walls. So these are walls with a plywood sheeting nailed over a wooden frame to allow the, the shear wall to actually move and the building to stay a little bit more uh, stationary. So think about how you have crumble points in your car for when you get in an accident, they make certain parts of the car weaker. So that takes up more of the force of the accident. So the parts that are important, like you and your gas tank, um, if you were to be in a car accident, that stuff won't crumble as much as other parts of the car that have been strategically designed to crumble. So this is a similar thing here that we do with buildings. Diagonal bracing or blocking. So this is just kind of basic engineering, but you can look at this building down here. If it was just these posts and then this building, these posts could rock back and forth in this building and would collapse a lot easier than it would if they put these diagonal bracings in because that just causes uh, the building to be a little bit more stable on these posts here. And the same, we do the same thing with roads and infrastructure. And for mitigation of these sorts of effects of earthquakes on infrastructure, they employ a number of things in, in seismically active areas to prevent road collapse and bridge collapse because any kind of recovery to an earthquake in a region would rely heavily on shipping to get supplies there, medical supplies, food supplies, uh, water, all that sort of thing. Uh, new materials even to rebuild. And so it's really critical that the roads remain up and clear. Uh, the pandemic sort of showed us a little bit of this, I think, with uh, there it was more of a shipping issue. Um, but you can see how quickly things can fall apart when trucks and boats and trains aren't coming in. And some solutions to this are they'll jacket the columns with steel. So here's a steel casing here. And what that does is that steel casing goes down into a concrete footing with pilings underneath. And this is just a, a system by which the ground shaking here is taken up by some of the pilings. The concrete is a little bit more stable. And then this steel casing prevents the actual column from falling, right? Um, this is concrete here. This is the original concrete column and maybe this stuff is sort of secondary, sort of aftermarket add-ons to the original construction of the bridge. And as you can imagine, the steel casing is not going to crumble the same way this original concrete would. So they'll encase this stuff in steel and they'll put grout in there to try to prevent any up-down movement. And this just sort of cushions that concrete portion where most of the earthquake energy is being taken up down here in the steel casing and in the footings and pilings. They'll wrap the vertical supports with rebar as well. So inside the concrete structure and they'll strap uh, joints together. So here they'll use steel cables or cable supports to hold the places where different concrete portions of the bridge are in contact with each other to try to just tie it together a little bit better. And you'll notice, like I said, most of this stuff is sort of tacked on after the fact. So you can bet a lot of new construction in these areas they would use a different system or, uh, you know, they would build it with this stuff already in place. And the whole thing here is to allow the structures to take up the stress or energy of the earthquake in a, a more calculated way. You know, we send those shock waves where we want them to go so that the bridge will remain standing. And it allows for buildings and structures to sway over time or move a little bit, give them a little bit of flexibility and give so that they can take up the the energy that way as well. So in addition to sort of what you build your structures out of, another thing that's very important when it comes to ground shaking 
is the substrate upon which you build. So in this case, substrate usually just means the foundation or the, not a building foundation, but a substrate can be anything like a, you know, you could call the canvas of a painting. You could call the canvas a substrate upon which the paint sits or, um, you know, circuit board manufacturing. The substrate is the green part of the circuit board that you put all of the parts on. It's just sort of the, the, the thing upon which you place something else. It's a kind of a general term. In this case, what substrate means is the kind of ground you're building on. And substrate, uh, ground substrates can basically be made of bedrock, soft mud, or sand and gravel. So soft ground shakes a lot more than, uh, than, than hard ground, like bedrock. So you notice here this soft mud has much larger amplitude of, of waves, seismic waves, compared to bedrock, compared to sand and gravel. And this would all be the same earthquake, right? And this is just how it's moving through different materials. And um, all those materials can kind of be found here in the San Francisco area, or actually, no, pardon me, this is Oakland. San Francisco is over here on the other side. So here's the Bay Bridge, um, here's Oakland. And you'll see we have bedrock up here. We have sand and gravel here. And then down closer to uh, San Pablo Bay, you've got uh, soft muds. And this is more saturated with water as well. So uh, I'll do a little demonstration in lab today. Uh, for those of you that missed that, um, just pay attention to this bit here. Uh, basically that soft mud is the worst thing to build on, bedrock is the best thing to build on, okay? And sand and gravel is kind of somewhere in between. Then we have landslides. So thousands of landslides can be triggered in a single earthquake. Uh, over there on the left, you'll see the Northridge earthquake in California that triggered almost 17,000 landslides. Uh, this is one such landslide where it's basically taken out the first block of this uh, subdivision here. So the earthquake caused a lot of this soft material to collapse and fall. And the way to really avoid this is just avoiding construction on steep slopes or at the base of steep slopes, or avoiding construction anywhere where there's unstable ground. So it takes a little foresight on our part, which uh, we're not always so great at, are we? But, uh, but, you know, live and learn, I suppose. And with soft sediment, we get ground failure. And this is because soft sediment amplifies earthquake waves. It prolongs shaking, and it causes this process called liquefaction. So it causes the ground to liquefy. Now it's not actually liquefying the rock, but it's, uh, it's basically shaking ground material, so ground water and sediment, and it's shaking it really fast. And this uh, leads to a process called liquefaction. And liquefaction is the sudden loss of strength of water saturated sandy soils. And the shaking causes uh, the saturated sands to consolidate and become more efficiently packed thus occupying less volume. So then the water is pushed out of the overlying soil and buildings are partially supported by that water, right? The soil and the water come together to form the ground and there's more soil than water, but water's filling in those pore spaces between the sediment grains. And when you shake the ground a lot, like I say, the solid material will kind of get more packed together. The water gets pushed out and what you end up getting is more water in certain areas with less soil. So it's not evenly distributed, it's, it's more little pockets. So you can get really liquefied water. You can see that picture down in the bottom right uh, of a car just completely just sinking into the ground, right? So there's a couple of videos here that show that process taking place, uh, but I encourage you to check those out. So if you were an engineer and you wanted to, uh, you know, build, you've got a job to build something, you'd want to have a geologist around because you're going to need to take subsurface readings, right? So you want to know what's under a home. And this is also good if you currently own a home. It's always good to know what's under your home. Uh, low density buildings or parks uh, in susceptible areas um, are going to be a problem. And uh, you're going to want to sink foundations into more solid material if you can. And uh, 
This is the case in some flooding areas, especially around the Mississippi and in places over in the, in the west part of the United States where they have lots of earthquakes. Sometimes they'll literally have to lift the whole house up, dig down, find more solid bedrock further down, and then anchor the foundations into that if they want to keep their home. As you can imagine, this is a very expensive process. So for ground rupture and changes in ground level, this is where the ground not only starts to fault and crack, but different sections begin to uh, change relative to one another as far as their, uh, their height or altitude. And this is where we get uh, slipping along those faults and the ground shaking and it's what we call rupture. And to mitigate this, faults need to be mapped because uh, any, any faults in a seismically active zone that's where the earthquake is going to affect the ground the most along those fault boundaries. And any stru structures that are straddling those faults, houses, roads, bridges, uh, anything like that, are susceptible to damage. And you can see over here, we've got ground rupturing down here at the bottom, where this section in the foreground is dropped down relative to this section in the background. And then here we have sort of a lateral view of that where across the, from side to side, you see the road uh, level changing. And the most damaging thing usually by, uh, from, you know, from historic quakes that we've had um, is fires. And so I asked you earlier to maybe start thinking about why we'd have fires. And if you thought ruptured gas lines or broken water mains, you'd be correct. So uh, we put most of our gas lines underground uh, we put a lot of water mains underground, and so one way that you could mitigate this in seismically active areas is to put gas lines above ground, so they're shaking, but they're not in the ground, so they're not likely to rupture, and we could put things in place just like we do with roads and bridges to prevent those above ground gas lines from being damaged to the point of rupturing. We, in many places, have auto shutdowns triggered by excessive vibration. So once there's enough vibration at the source of the, you know, at, at, a, ga at a gas plant or wherever gas is being distributed, there'll be auto shutoffs so that there's no gas in the lines. Uh, and if there is gas in the lines and it ruptures, the fire will burn out what's left in the lines quickly without con a continual source of gas feeding that fire. And similarly, they'll, you know, they'll, cl they'll close main gas lines following an earthquake too. So in addition to auto triggers, um, also, you know, municipalities are quick to run around and try to close all those lines as soon as possible to prevent any fires from continuing to burn after the earthquake. So this is the portion of lecture where I would have done the lab, um, but this is the lab for this, uh, this or for tonight. And we're going to be determining the strength of earthquakes and we're going to be locating earthquakes based on SP wave intervals, so arrival times, uh, to get a distance and then, you know, from different locations, triangulate that distance from that location and see where they all intersect. So you have that to look forward to this evening. Then, of course, we have tsunamis triggered by earthquakes. So a tsunami is seafloor that's disrupted by faulting, volcanic eruptions, landslides, meteor impacts. So anything that's not weather related, uh, but more geologically related, we would call a tsunami. You can get giant wave activity during a hurricane, let's say, but that's not, um, that's more affected by climate and not by uh, changes in the, uh, the Earth's subsurface and crustal structure. And basically this motion, uh, you can imagine uh, displacement down here at the bottom would cause a sudden displacement in the water column and that moves out in waves. And what's interesting here, different than an earthquake, is this displacement, if it were an earthquake, we would see more damage here and then moving out through this rock, the damage would get less and less. The opposite is true of the water sitting above the rock causing the tsunami. At sea level, right above the, you know, at the sort of the epicenter of the displacement, we see smaller waves, right? But then as we start to move closer to shore, you're getting interference patterns and things like that. So if you've ever been to the ocean or even Lake Michigan, you'll see that waves tend to be bigger as we move closer to shore, they start to break. So this is the more dangerous area further away from the displacement and closest to shore. But one thing is tsunamis are not cresting waves, okay? So the tsunami is the actual wave here, 
once it breaks here they're just cresting waves so this is the part that does the most damage but every wave here is a tsunami so I just wanted to point that out waves radiate out at speeds of about 800 kilometers per hour or 480 miles per hour in the open ocean they have much longer wavelengths and lower amplitudes like I said and then in shallow water you get uh, velocity increases and wavelength uh, increases and that just causes a lot more damage as the height of those tsunamis increases and this is a repeat slide sorry about that um, but you can kind of see you know just that picture's a little bit bigger there but basically I just talked about all this so some more facts about tsunamis um, a tsunami from a major earthquake so um, a magnitude 7 or higher can be 15 meters high or 50 feet high and travel about 50 to 60 kilometers per hour on land that's about 40 miles per hour uh, waves arrive in successive crests that can be as much as 20 minutes apart so um, here's a diagram down here showing you know uh, basically different tsunamis triggered from different different places and kind of how they move across so they move fairly uniform and uh, if this were to happen and you're in Honolulu you're in big trouble uh, as you can see because you're at a point where three earthquake tsunamis are kind of hitting you at the same time so that tsunami in Japan that uh, took out Fukushima and uh, most of the coastal cities in the northern part of Japan there was 126 feet high um, there's a topo map of Grand Rapids if you wanted to look and see what the highest point is in Grand Rapids relative to the river the lowest point and you could see 126 feet high tsunami would pretty much decimate the entire city um, yeah our buildings down here you know maybe twice that I mean this would mostly be covered maybe the hill maybe just the tops of these buildings would be sticking out of the water So the potential for tsunami damage depends on the source of the me source mechanism so how much displacement on the fault um, how, how large the earthquake that sort of thing the distance from travel so remember greater distance uh, more amplification of the waves over time and the topography of the continental shelf is it flat or is it steep um, and this has to do with run up so if it's flat you're going to get more run up inland right so more encroachment of that wave onto the, the land uh, possibly damaging structures whereas steep topography in the sh in the continental shelf like in the in the shallow shore here if it's steeper a lot of that force gets taken up by that steeper wall and then the configuration of coastlines so bays so if you're on a bay that focuses that tsunami energy much better than if you were on a peninsula or uh, or you know or some, some similar structure out there where um, it would dissipate the the wave a little more around you where yeah, hopefully that makes sense so how to build um, you want to put the narrowest dimensions toward the wave uh, like I just said so if, if your city if you're on a narrower area um, no sorry so if you if you have like a narrower part of the building you want to turn that part so that it's facing the wave so if you have a, a long narrow house right where it's longer than it is wide you would put that the width part the narrower part uh, facing towards the coastline uh, have open lower floors that allow water to pass through them so this is fairly common in, in a lot of coastal cities you'll see this in residential houses the bottom floor uh, has lots of big open uh, doors and windows that will allow the water to move through don't build in low-lying areas uh, of susceptible coastline so here's an example of that lower floor here's an example of a lower floor here as well that where this is open and the water can just kind of move through and most of the people would be up in this upper structure here with most of the your valuables and your pets and your children and all that stuff and then avoid these low-lying areas and try not to build too much on bays parks are fine in bays we don't really mind if parks flood very much but you wouldn't want to put a neighborhood here uh, looks like I had some repeat sides there sorry 
So, um, so what causes some of these? So common characteristics. So we have intraqu intraplate quakes. So uh, interplate would be at plate boundaries. Intra means in the middle of, of plates. Um, and so we do get these. We've had uh, earthquakes in Michigan. Down here, you'll see this kind of strange area here in the Ozarks where we've got like this is, uh, what is it? Eastern Missouri, Southern Illinois, Northern Arkansas where we have an unusually high amount of earthquakes. And this is probably due to what we call blind faults. So they're really deep faults in the crust, brittle faults. Uh, so just a, like split faults in the rock uh, that have been covered up by other bedrock or sediment. And so they're not exposed to the surface. And so we don't know they're there. And you can have a shift out here, uh, some kind of tectonic activity that's uh, pushing and causing stress. And most of the most of the continent over here in the in the two thirds eastern portion, uh, east of the Rockies, is mostly impervious to these stresses, right? Because most of that stuff is being taken up by volcanism and deformation over here on the west coast. But over time, you can get enough pressure building up where these areas where there's these hidden faults that are underground and buried can be activated, uh, and that's what we see, or at least that's what we think is happening over here. So you can get some pretty intense earthquakes in the middle of plates uh, as well as at the boundaries. And sometimes these, uh, these faults, these buried faults in uh, here in kind of the middle of the, the plate are oftentimes failed rift zones. Uh, we have one up in the UP um, that does experience some earthquake activity from time to time, uh, the mid-continent rift. And what these are, um, are failed rifts. So a rifting or a divergent boundary is produced in the middle of a continent. Um, you can think the breakup of Pangaea, there were these everywhere, right? But it can happen in, in, you know, in kind of smaller groups in the North American continent, let's say, where you get a, a divergent boundary beginning to form between two um, sections of the continent. And what happens is it starts to spread. Uh, and if it were to continue, it would look a lot like Africa and South America do today, where there's a big ocean between them because they're, they're, uh, they're divergent and they're rifting apart. Um, but sometimes it doesn't get far enough for ocean water to encroach in there. You don't actually get seafloor spreading. You just get some splitting and some volcanism along the continent. And then for whatever reason, that stops. Uh, there might be another plate that moves in from another area and forces the fault to slam shut again. There's a number of different mechanisms here, but the takeaway is that the, now there's a fault there, right? And the crust has been stretched and weakened by these faults, and then they can produce earthquakes later. One such uh, failed rift is the New Madrid seismic zone in that area of southeastern Missouri that I mentioned, and it's a major geologic hazard in, in the country. It's responsible for the largest earthquake in the continental U.S. ever, which was a magnitude 8. Again, here's a picture of where you're most likely to experience earthquakes. Here's the new uh, Madrid seismic zone, and then you've got this area out here, notice the highest is uh, 32 plus, uh, and that's all along Southern California here along the San Andreas Fault. And then there's some pink here in Missouri. So I'll wrap up by talking about some historical earthquakes. Here's a sort of notable earthquakes over the last 600 years or so. And uh, you'll see the highest one with the most deaths was in uh, Shenzhen, China, possibly the greatest natural disaster of all time, killed about 830,000 people in 1556. Uh, some other notable ones here, uh, Chongqing, I think, is how you say that, Chongqing, China. Uh, it wasn't predicted. Uh, this happened in 1976, killed 240,000 people. It's a 
we were taking measurements then, so we know it was a 7.6 on the Richter scale. Uh, but yeah, so if you look through here, you'll see kind of some uh, er notable earthquakes and then some comments about them. So I encourage you to read through that. So there's a lot packed into this particular figure, but I want to show you the main takeaway here is that uh, most of the earthquakes annually that the world experiences are at about a two or three or lower, okay? Um, you know, that's about almost 15, almost, almost 1.5 million earthquakes a year are almost too small to be felt. Then we start to get up into the higher levels, uh, magnitude fives, magnitude six, magnitude seven, uh, still a fairly significant amount. This is enough to cause moderate damage, property damage, things like that. And then we have some real strong ones up here. Maybe we'll have one really big strong one uh, per year somewhere on the planet. Um, unfortunately for Asia, a lot of times these are in Asia, uh, sometimes South America. Uh, there was the really bad one in uh, in Turkey uh, earlier this year. Uh, there was a really bad one in Bangladesh a few years back. So yeah, there's uh, unfortunately they get some pretty big ones from time to time. Some of you might remember the Haiti earthquake in 2010, although um, many of you were probably too young, um, but that was pretty brutal as well. So one thing about earthquakes that we as geologists kind of appreciate is that they are strong enough to travel around the entire world. And if you have sensitive enough equipment, you can pick up earthquakes almost anywhere on the planet from anywhere else on the planet. And, but one thing that earthquakes do that's very interesting and informs a lot of what we know about the interior of the earth is uh, seismic wave travel times do not correspond to travel distances. So this is uh, one of your discussion questions. Uh, and this is because there's variations in the properties of the material encountered by the waves within the earth. So uh, what does that mean? And, and you can see over here on the right, um, you know, these waves are deflecting off the outer core. Uh, some waves are moving through the outer core but uh, they're refracted at some angle, some are moving straight through, and then like I said, some are deflecting away, not traveling through the outer core. So why is that? Well, remember, seismic waves radiate in all directions, so from the epicenter and in, out into the, the direction in a radial pattern. At a boundary, the wave will either refract, so it'll move into it, but refract just like light does through glass, or it'll be reflected off that surface. And these are boundaries between uh, different dense air, density areas within the crust, or sorry, within the crust and mantle and core. Sometimes waves can slow down or speed up depending on the material that they're moving through. Um, and if they move from faster to slower material, they tend to um, refract down angle so here's the angle coming in and then they'll they'll hit a slower material and they'll they won't move as far through that material in the direction that the original wave was moving and in slower to faster material they'll hit and then when they hit this faster material they'll actually still be going in the same direction but they'll refract upward this way and move uh, faster uh, through that that faster material uh, but cover more ground in less time obviously and when a wave is rising from faster to slower, it's moving slower in the direction of this vector um, and it's refracting at a steeper angle here. So seismic waves bend as they travel through the crust and the mantle. So here's the earthquake at the crust here. When it hits the mantle, it bends, right? Then it hits the outer core, does not go there, right? And then reflects back up and so we can, if we know the, uh, the epicenter of the earthquake at, at this point A here, we could, you know, see the angle that that hits us here, and we can know kind of how far down into the mantle it traveled, did it reflect off things, and, and things like that. This is a simplified version, but this is something that geologists study. And these curved paths tell us something about the MOHO, 
which is short for a uh, somewhat complicated uh, Russian name. Um, and it tells us, it helps us uh, kind of understand where the crust mantle boundary is. So um, that's one thing that it tells us. So close to the earthquake, the path through the crusts arrived first. And then further uh, paths for, uh, through the faster mantle arrived first. So the idea here is you've got an earthquake, you've got a station here. If the earthquake is close, if you're close to the earthquake, you're going to get that crustal stuff first, right? Because that's, while the mantle is faster, it moves through the mantle faster, you're close enough that this wave is going to get here first. But if you're further away, those waves move down into the mantle, travel faster and pass the waves that are moving through the crust, and then those mantle ones will come at you. And we know they're mantle ones because they're hitting this station at a higher angle than this one's going to. Notice this angle here is kind of 45. This is more of a 60 degree angle here. And we're picking all this kind of stuff up with our instrumentation. And one very, very interesting thing, and one of the reasons that we suspect that the outer core is liquid is because uh, the angles at which P waves move uh, through and appear at different angles on opposite sides of the Earth. So that's one thing. We know P waves can travel through both solids and liquids, because remember, P waves are compressional, and you can compress water. Uh, not infinitely, you can only compress it to a point. But if I push water underwater, you're going to feel it, right? But if I just move my hand side to side, you don't feel it nearly as much because those shear waves, my side to side motion, they're just being taken up by the water. But if I push the water, then that, that wave that I'm pushing through, uh, that, that can travel through liquid. So P waves travel through liquid, albeit at some kind of refracted angle, whereas S waves or shear waves travel through solid rock and mantle just fine, but once they get to the liquid outer core, they reflect away or don't travel through at all. So what we see is at the opposite side, or southern hemisphere, let's say in this case, of an earthquake that happens right about at the North Pole, we see S waves and P waves at certain angles here along the northern hemisphere, then those S waves completely disappear in the southern hemisphere and we see some weird refracted angles of P waves coming through. So we call this the S wave shadow zone. And that's what leads us to believe that based on, you know, they've done thousands and thousands and thousands of measurements around the earth. And that's how they've come up with the, basically the depth or, or uh, circumference or diameter, however you want to think of it, of the inner core and the fact that its composition is liquid. So this lab, Substrates and Hazards, I'm actually just going to do as a demo. Um, for those of you that miss lab tonight uh, and miss that demo, well, you can just quick do that demo on Tuesday or next Thursday, depending. Uh, it's just a little thing with some pennies and some sand that I'm going to show everybody to show them how different substrates uh, can cause different differences in stability and therefore different hazards. So that wraps up our section on earthquakes. I will see you all tonight. I'll get this posted beforehand. Obviously, I don't expect you to watch it, but uh, definitely uh, give this a watch. Well, now you're at the end of it, so I don't know why I'm telling you. Uh, so never mind. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Email me with any questions or post in the office, uh, basically office hours questions forum um, so that uh, other people can get something back from answers to your questions that I might give you, and have a good one.